It is the fifth year of the war for America. Two unlikely looking armies cut their way through the wilderness. Wearing frontier hunting shirts, they carry knives and tomahawks. Many carry the same guns they use to shoot at wolves and deer. Those loyal to the British crown wear pine twigs in their hats. Those who call themselves American patriots have slipped a piece of paper into theirs. It is the only way to tell one side from the other. Until a few months ago, these men were neighbors. These two rough and ill-equipped militias have no idea they are about to change the course of a war fought far to the north by far more imposing armies. Here, in the backwoods of the Carolinas, on an isolated hilltop known as King's Mountain, they will turn the tide of the war and end one of the bloodiest years of the American Revolution. Seventeen eighty has been a dark year for the Patriot cause. It is the year of Benedict Arnold's treason, a year of starvation for General George Washington's ragged little army at Morristown, New Jersey. And it is a year of unrelenting defeat for Patriot forces. But these British victories have come at a high price. The King's ministers, deep in debt and confronting serious domestic problems, can squander no more men or treasure on this American war. The British commander in North America, Sir Henry Clinton, attempts to ease the demands on his troops. He will shift the war to the American South, where sizable support from civilian loyalists is expected. On May 12th, a keystone in the Southern Theater falls. Charleston, America's fourth largest city with its 5,500-man garrison, surrenders. It is the worst defeat yet suffered by the Americans. British regiments sweep through South Carolina. They establish a chain of posts from Georgetown to Augusta on the Savannah River to Fort 96 on the western frontier. In London, Lord George Germain, Secretary of State for the American Department, expresses the sentiments of his monarch. The glorious and important event of the reduction of Charleston and the destruction or capture of the whole rebel land and naval force that defended it gave His Majesty the highest satisfaction. In the forefront of the British advance is Lieutenant Colonel Bannistray Tarleton. He commands the British Legion, a mixed force of cavalry and light infantry renowned for its ruthlessness. Tarleton is an aristocrat educated at Oxford and trained as a lawyer. The fiery redhead has no sympathy for those who oppose his king. He joins the army at the first uprising. It is Tarleton who is ordered to head off a small contingent of Americans riding from Virginia. Colonel Abraham Buford, an experienced militia officer, realizes he has come too late to aid American troops in Charleston. He turns his 350 Virginia Patriots towards the north, with Tarleton and 250 cavalrymen in close pursuit. They catch up with Buford near the North Carolina border, at a small settlement called the Waxhaws. Although Tarleton is outnumbered, his aggressive, well-trained and disciplined force soon overtakes Buford's men. Tarleton boldly demands the surrender of Buford's force. The colonel refuses, but before he can properly form his lines, the British dragoons are upon him. The Americans have no chance. As the battle develops, Buford realizes that surrender is his only option. He raises a white flag. Some of his men, taking off strips of their linen white clothing, attach them to the ends of their bayonets, their ramrods, their rifles, and their muskets, waving them in the air to halt the British. Perhaps there will be quarter. Tarleton's dragoons mix with the Americans, cutting and slashing with their sabers. All calls for quarter are ignored. 113 Virginians are killed, and another 150 so badly wounded that they are left for dead on the field. Tarleton's loss is but five killed and 12 wounded. An American army surgeon describes the horrific encounter. The demand for quarter, seldom refused to a vanquished foe, was at once found to be in vain. Not a man was spared. For 15 minutes after every man was prostrate, they went over the ground, 
plunging their bayonets into everyone that exhibited any signs of life. And in some instances, where several had fallen one over the other, these monsters were seen to throw off on the point of the bayonet the uppermost to come at those beneath. The truth is that the British troops passed through Buford's men, turned around, passed through again, and then on the third time as they passed through the American troops, they pulled off the wounded and dead to stab and bayonet those that were underneath. Every man in Buford's command was either killed or wounded. From this day on, this would be known as Tarleton's Quarter. News of the victory reaches Clinton in Charleston. Now confident that loyalists throughout the Carolinas will rally to their king, he sends his assurances to Lord Germain. With great pleasure, I further report to your lordship that the inhabitants from every quarter repair to declare their allegiance to the king. I may venture to assert that there are few men in South Carolina who are not either our prisoners or in arms with us. But Clinton and the British command have miscalculated. Waxhaws, where Tarleton rode down on the Americans, is a close-knit enclave of Scots-Irish farmers. The deeply religious community is appalled by the slaughter that has taken place outside its doors. They will not soon forget nor forgive the British. The Waxhaws massacre may be a defeat for the Americans, but for the British, it will prove to be a fatal mistake. It is June of 1780. For Americans, the summer marks a low point in the Revolution. The city of Charleston, South Carolina is in British hands, and American troops are on the run in the Southern Theater. Riding the crest of these victories, British commander Henry Clinton prepares to set sail for New York. His dominion of the South is nearly complete. Though there are pockets of patriot resistance in South Carolina, many settlers are Tory sympathizers, loyal to the Crown. The remaining population is comprised of insular clans of rough Scots-Irish frontiersmen. They're expected to sit out any conflict between Britain and her former colonies. Here in the South, there are a lot of things to attract the British, not only the food and horses, but also great manpower, and they believe the majority of the Southerners are loyal to the king and the royal government. A new commander will now take control of the Southern theater. Clinton turns over command to General Charles Cornwallis, a man he has little admiration for. Clinton orders Cornwallis to augment his forces with Carolinians still loyal to the king and suppress this rebellion once and for all. Cornwallis is not eager to recruit these undisciplined backwoodsmen. He fears they may be little more than rebels in disguise. This means some of the most violent rebels and persecutors of the whole province are declared faithful subjects and are promised to be protected in their persons and their properties. But Cornwallis finds the matter taken out of his hands. Before he departs, Clinton creates the position of inspector of militia in the southern provinces. His choice for this independent command, a 35-year-old major of the 71st Highland Regiment named Patrick Ferguson. Ferguson is ordered to raise a force of 4,000 loyalist militia and to put a thousand of them into the field ready for action. They're here because they believe there are a lot of Tories here that are going to help them. And that's what Ferguson is about. Ferguson is a man who can come and deal basically with these southern crackers. He can take these southern crackers and put butcher knives on the ends of muskets and try to make them regular troops. That's why Ferguson is important. Ferguson is a hero to his men, who affectionately call him the Bulldog, but is considered a wild man by his superiors. Few officers in the British service are as well known as this Scottish major, and few can boast as remarkable a military career. Patrick Ferguson, born of a noble family in Scotland, accepted his first rank in the military at the age of 14. He was still a very young man when he arrived here in America. Ferguson began his military career in 1759 with a commission in the Royal North British Dragoons. After contracting a deadly fever fighting in the West Indies, 
Ferguson devotes his convalescence to the study of firearms. The British were using smooth bore brown bass muskets. They were extremely inaccurate. Ferguson, a noted hunter and marksman, widely regarded as the best shot in the British Army, designs a breech-loading rifle. It can be fired quickly and more accurately, and unlike any other weapon of its day, from a prone position. Ferguson is soon on his way to America in command of a hundred hand-picked soldiers. He trains them to fire from hidden positions, wear camouflage, and fight in an unheard of guerrilla style. Higher ranking officers who looked upon this young whippersnapper as a Johnny come lately trying to change the methods of warfare did not find favor with Ferguson and his rifle. They felt that he did not have enough experience to make such sweeping changes and they also felt that their method of fighting had been the, for the best of the empire and would continue to be the best. In the fall of 1777, near present-day Chester, Pennsylvania, in what will be called the Battle of Brandywine, Ferguson finally gets his chance to prove the worth of his riflemen and their unconventional methods. He had his man, men prone on the ground, dressed in somewhat camouflaged clothing, and he proved to all of the other officers that his style of fighting was the best, he had the lowest death and wounded ratio of any unit on the field. It is during a scouting expedition just before this battle that a remarkable incident occurs, one which could potentially change the outcome of the revolution and American history. A high-ranking American officer rides within a hundred yards of where Ferguson is hiding. Captain Patrick Ferguson, the best shot in the British Army, takes careful aim at the American general who now turns to look at him. The officer's name, General George Washington. Ferguson recounts what happens next. I advanced from the wood towards him. Upon my calling, he stopped, but after looking at me, proceeded. Ferguson has Washington and the fate of the American Revolution within his sights. But at the last moment, the Scotsman holds his fire. As I was within that distance at which, in the quickest firing, I have seldom missed a sheet of paper, and could have lodged half a dozen balls in him or about him before he was out of my reach. But it was not pleasant to fire at the back of an unoffending individual who was acquitting himself very coolly of his duty. So I let him alone. Within moments of this gallant act, the Battle of Brandywine is underway. Ferguson is seriously wounded, his right elbow shattered by a rifle ball. His doctors consider amputation, though Ferguson himself has his own opinion. The doctors still doubt whether my right arm will belong to the worms. I think I shall keep it, for I have fought a long and painful battle for it, and have held out well. In the weeks that follow, Ferguson retrains himself to write with his left hand, then to fence, then to fire a weapon. Unable to signal commands and hold the reins of his horse, he equips himself with a silver whistle, and devises a series of signals to direct his troops. Some nine months after being wounded, Ferguson returns to active duty, having lost his specially designed rifles and guerrilla fighters during his long convalescence. Ferguson still distinguishes himself at the battles of Monmouth and Charleston, drawing the attention of Sir Henry Clinton. In this brave and idiosyncratic leader, Clinton sees a man who can appeal to the Carolina frontiersmen, and draw them to the British side. Without consulting his other commanders, Clinton handpicks Ferguson to recruit and command all the militia in the Southern theater. It is a bold and dangerous move. Ferguson will win many frontiersmen to the British cause, but as Clinton will learn too late, he will prove equally adept at making enemies. As the summer of 1780 comes to the Carolinas, the British High Command prepares for a final assault against American troops in the Southern Theater. But even as the plans are made, a deadly disunity is growing. The command of British troops in the South has fallen to General Charles Cornwallis. Control of the civilian militia has been given to the brilliant but unorthodox Captain Patrick Ferguson. From the start, Ferguson clashes with Cornwallis and the other British top commander, Lieutenant Colonel Banastray Tarleton. 
the man who led the killing of the wounded during the recent Waxhaw's massacre. They could not agree how war should be carried out. Ferguson was thinking not only in the terms of winning the war, but living with those that he had defeated in the future. Carlton had no concern whatsoever about the future. He planned to win the war and to get out. Ferguson wants to bring the Americans back to their king, not terrorize them. He goes so far as to arrest some of Tarleton's men for crimes against the local population. The two men come to despise each other. Ferguson believed that he could convince people which side was the correct side to be on. And he was often sitting down with people, talking to them, asking them their opinion, and trying to persuade them to his viewpoint. Tarleton practiced the opposite. Tarleton believed that war should be made so terrible that people would quit fighting just to get out of all of the killing and maiming. Despite the opposition of Cornwallis and Tarleton, Ferguson's recruitment efforts are a remarkable success. His loyalist militia swells to 4,000 recruits, with more than 1,000 soon in the field under arms. One of Ferguson's lieutenants remarks on the achievement. This settlement is composed of the most violent rebels I ever saw. But the poor deluded people of this province begin to be sensible of their error and come in very fast. Among the civilians who attach themselves to Ferguson are two ladies of questionable repute. They provide a number of services for the personable commander, including washing his linen. Ferguson had two ladies that traveled with him, both with the name of Virginia, Virginia Sal and Virginia Paul. Some of the soldiers laughed and joked that Ferguson was really a smart man because no matter which ear he whispered sweet nothings into, he would not call her by the wrong name. While Ferguson recruits his loyalist militia, Lord Cornwallis advances northward with his main army, establishing a chain of fortified posts throughout South Carolina, at Augusta, at 96, at Rocky Mount, and at Camden. As the British advance, American dissatisfaction grows with General George Washington. The war seems to be dragging on endlessly. Congress, without consulting Washington, assigns command of all southern forces to General Horatio Gates, called the Hero of Saratoga. The ambitious Gates, who hopes to replace Washington as army commander, assumes command of 1,400 Continentals in North Carolina on July 25, 1780. Gates, reinforced by North Carolina militia, immediately advances toward the British outpost at Camden. The aggressive general pushes his 3,000 men too hard and too fast. Starving, they begin eating green corn along the march, and many succumb to dysentery. At Camden, Cornwallis awaits the enfeebled army with 1,900 battle-tested veterans. On August 16, 1780, Gates confronts Cornwallis. The battle is over quickly. The Redcoats rout the American militia and cut down the stalwart Continentals. General Gates is among the first to flee the field of battle. His northern laurels, as one wag puts it, turn to weeping willows in the south. Cornwallis claims 800 Americans dead or wounded and another thousand taken prisoner. Then Tarleton and his men arrive, and, as in the wake of the Waxhaw's massacre, they act without mercy. One rebel officer describes the aftermath. In a few days after General Gates' defeat, Lord Cornwallis let loose the dogs of war upon the poor inhabitants, and Tarleton, with his bloodhounds, excelled in brutality. Unfortunate men, who were found peaceably and quietly at their homes, were cut to pieces and every species of cruelty was exercised throughout the country. The victory is complete. The road to North Carolina and beyond is wide open. But Lord Cornwallis has also suffered losses. 20% of his redcoats have fallen at Camden, and even more are sick with fever. Now, more than ever, he is dependent upon the Loyalist militia being recruited by Ferguson. But Ferguson and his men are on a different road, one leading directly to a flat-topped rise on the border of the Carolinas, best known as a place to graze raw-boned cattle, a place called King's Mountain. 